teenagers would do. And my grandfather, he took me aside basically, and he says, you know, are you going to sit there and complain or are you going to do something about it? So um, I chose to do something about it, maybe a lot more than he had anticipated, but at least I did something. So you are doing something involved, getting involved in the Atlanta student movement almost as soon as you set foot on Morehouse College's campus. Uh, so you were part of the sit-ins and you were part of the boycotts of department stores uh, in downtown Atlanta. Um, one of the things that I learned from this book that I didn't realize was that there were actually guerrilla tactics that were involved in sit-ins. Could you describe that for us? Well, once these sit-ins started, uh, uh, we had assignments. And we were lucky because we also had, believe it or not, a radio control vehicle, a hamster, and he was able to dispatch people to places we needed to get them to. So what would happen is that uh, we, at the time, we did not have a jail no bail policy. So if we were asked to leave, we would leave. And as soon as they, the, the, the establishment would reopen the lunch counter, we would dispatch another uh, group of sit inners And because there was three of us who worked together, and they call us the gorillas because the three of us could close down any lunch counter, 20 to 30 seats. And that kept the establishments, you know, off balance. And, you know, we, you know, believe it or not, in spite of the fact that we were sitting in every day, we still managed to get our assignments done because when you're sitting in and they're not going to feed you, you sit there at the lunch counter and you do your homework. You do your studies right there in the, in the, in the establishment. So uh, I developed some pretty good study habits while I was sitting in. That's so interesting to hear. I mean, one of the things that was interesting was that as, as, as somebody who was sitting in, you didn't sit with your friends, you actually spread out because people didn't want to sit next to black people. So you could shut the counter down yeah. by just spreading out, spreading a few people out across an, an entire, entire lunch counter. Um, so you also uh, note uh, that there were uh, generational differences in terms of preferences. So you talk about that, especially when, uh, uh, Rich's department store in particular, what's now um, our Macy's down here, um, you know, agreed to, uh, you know, to comply with the student demands, but they wanted to wait before the uh, desegregation was actually instituted. And so there were some differences between the student activists um, and some of, of their older advisors. Could you talk about that? Well, after the, 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 the stores decided to negotiate with the students, and uh, we were successful in, in them meeting our demands. And we wanted to go out and start celebrating the next day. You know, that's, that's the youth in us. But Dr. King says to us, he says, look, um, this is new to you and this is new to them. And we need to have time for both sides to acclimate to, this, to, the, to the new things that were happening in our lives. Because it not only involved being able to eat in restaurants, but also it involved hirings. See, in most of your downtown stores, the only people, black people down there were either maids or janitors or some other menial job. So the, the transition was gonna take some time for everyone to acclimate. And his advice is what calmed us down because we ended up crying and everything else that night because we were so excited because change was gonna come, but then there was this pause. We had to wait to September. So, uh, but but I think it was a good thing because a, a good lesson learned, uh, and I wish we could do it today. We learned to compromise. Compromise is a dirty word today. I'll come back to compromise uh, a little bit later. I want to talk about your role um, in 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 the Freedom Rides. Uh, casual observers. Uh, you know, know what the Freedom Rides are. Um, they know that they were organized, but I don't know if people recognize how organized the Freedom Riders were. So for instance, you actually had to apply to be a Freedom Rider. So tell us about the application process and why you were chosen. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, Congress of Racial Equality knew there were a lot of trained kids throughout the South in nonviolence. But uh, they wanted to, I guess, basically get the cream of the crop. So they asked for applications. And uh, it was easy for those kids who were you know, 21 years or older. But for those of us who are 18, we had to get our parents' permission. And once you got that, you had to agree to uh, be nonviolent and you had to attend three days of nonviolent training in Washington, DC. But uh, I, often wondered why they chose me because there were a lot of other kids 
in Atlanta who were had as much or more experience than I. But I think one of the things that helped me out is that I was so young, I didn't have any negatives in my background. You know, in those days, anything that was negative about you, uh, they were used against not only you, but against the organization. So we didn't want that kind of uh, diversion from our mission, which was to prove to the nation that those signs were everywhere and that the uh, certain cities and certain states were not going to abide by the Supreme Court decisions that authorized. It says that we could, you know, use the buses, bus stations, and and see and the seating on the buses. All that was was predetermined. But there were a lot of places where they, the signs either were there or for some reason people continued in the old ways, even though the signs had been taken down. People continued, black people continued to segregate themselves even though the signs had been taken down. And, and, and one of the things that people might not also know is I think you know that there was planning involved, but that it was really extensive, that there had been scouting uh, so that people had actually ridden the trail beforehand and told you ahead of time, like, here are the signs that you could expect. Here's where you're probably going to see segregation rigidly enforced versus not rigidly enforced. The other thing that I'm not sure, uh, you know, people are always uh, aware of is that it wasn't just one long ride. So I think, you know, if any of you, if any of us have ever, you know, ridden a Greyhound bus before for any length of time, you know, it's a long ride because there are lots of stops, but you figure you get on the bus, you take your blanket, and then you wake up 24 hours later, wherever it is that you're supposed supposed to be. Um, but you actually did this, you know, uh, starting and stopping with intentional, we're going to, you know, go 100 miles this day, we're going to go 150 miles the next day. What was the logic behind taking uh, those short uh, trips? And then also the roles that people played. So people were jumping different lines between Greyhound and Trailways, and people were playing different roles on, on the bus, depending on sort of, you know, which team they were assigned that day and, and what their racial background was. Wow. Uh, one of the, the reasons uh, for the different stops is one thing we wanted to make sure we were off the road by nightfall. We did not want to get caught out after dark because anything can and will happen after darkness. And that can, second, we changed buses. We switched buses each day. In other words, if I came into a town on Greyhound that would leave on a, on a railway. Reason for that, if anyone was following us, it wouldn't be very easy for them to do so because the buses generally, their departure times were staggered. So a one bus would leave at say at one and one at three o'clock and so forth. Also, another thing is that the planning was required because we had to have lodging. And uh, even though it was a green book, um, when you got 13 to 15 people that require lodging every night plus meals, that, that would have been very expensive. So we relied on the various congregations uh, throughout the, the ride to provide us not only uh, uh, lodging at night, but a lot of them, them fed us. And here are people that didn't have an awful lot, but they gave us the best they had. And some of the best times as far as food and relaxation was during the trip because I got to meet an awful lot of people and our, a lot of people showed a tremendous amount of kindness to all well, towards strangers. This was also a bit of a speaking tour because when you would stop in cities, um, there was often there are often events at you know uh, local civil rights meetings at the churches who were involved in the movement. Uh, can you uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the speaking tour and 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 the types of people that you would meet um, in these mass congregations? Well, each night we generally had uh, the evening meal together, we and we would also have a mass meeting, and we would go to the churches and we would solicit their support. And also we solicit financial support because uh, it was expensive, not only your bus ticket, but also you had to have money. One thing uh, James Farmer wanted to make sure of, he said it would be very embarrassing, not only for us, but for the organization. If you went into a place, ordered a meal, and by chance they served you and you didn't have the money. Likewise, there were vacancy laws in led me to Southern towns and basically it says that if you've got less than $10 on your person, you could be arrested as a vagrant. And, uh, you know, uh, I guess we had come out of a period of peonage where there was a lot of convict labor and things that were going on throughout the South. So you didn't want to get people locked up on something that had nothing to do with what we were doing. So, you know, that raises an interesting question and, and, and you brought it up before and you say it. Some people would look at the um, desire to observe vagrancy laws um, 
as, as some form of respectability politics. And that's certainly something that's come up today. Um, and, and, and there are certainly troubling aspects of respectability politics that need to, to, to be challenged. Um, but what parts of, of respectability politics, if you will, were actually really important to actually helping to advance the message of civil rights during the Freedom Rides? Well, uh, I think the, the, the most important thing was, was knowledge. You have to realize, and I, 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 didn't, I wasn't aware of it, but so many people were not aware, especially outside of the South, of what was going on. First of all, we were riding buses, normal buses. They were not chartered. We paid regular fare. Yet, uh, they wanted to treat us differently. For example, if there was a colored waiting room, it was a small dinky place, and they served your food through a cubby hole. But you paid the same price as everyone who was sitting in the main dining room. So, but most people couldn't believe how archaic, you know, how, how silly or stupid that was. So one of the things we had to do was inform people and let them see because they said you would, they did what because of what, and that's how ironic some of, of the things were. People just couldn't believe that those kind of policies existed in 1960. Um, I was born in the 70s and I grew up in the town where the cubby hole happened. So you know, I, it's, it's you know it's always sobering to to realize you know that and you know well, your parents tell you things, but it's it's always important to to, to see them sort of uh, confirmed by by other people. So the further south you went, the more harried it got. So there were some places where you were able to, you know, integrate spaces without event, um, but there were other spaces where you got challenged um, and threatened and, 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 and even assaulted. Um, and so uh, probably sort of the most dramatic place was in Birmingham, Alabama. So what was uh, sort of, you know, the, the scariest part of it? Uh, you tell very vivid stories about getting separated from the team and having to be concerned about making sure that everybody was safe and not knowing where everybody was, uh, where everybody was. And I think we forget about how important that is in an era where people don't have cell phones, where they can text message each other to figure out how you keep track of people under these types of circumstances where people are, are you know, fleeing for their lives. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? I guess the, the most frightening part of our job on the, on the trailway was uh, when we got to Anderson, uh, we were informed that the Greyhound bus had been set afire and we knew our friends was on it. So they wanted to segregate the bus there in Anderson. And when we refused, uh, eight men got on the bus and they started beating us and forcing us towards the back of the bus. Eventually, uh, they got us there. They physically threw us to the back of the bus and they sat midway of the bus and taunted us all the way into Birmingham. And when we got to Birmingham, of course, they got out the bus ahead of us uh, because they were near the front and they joined with their buddies who were already there, which we didn't were not aware of that the bus station uh, in Birmingham, the entire wall was lined with men who had evil intent. And James Peck and I, who were the designated testers, we were grossly outnumbered. And of course they proceeded to beat us uh, very viciously there in Birmingham. And yet after the Birmingham incident, your team reconstituted um, and you decided to keep on going and to end the journey as planned in New Orleans. Why did you choose to go on? Well, we took a vote. I mean, we were a democratic group and uh, the uh, majority won that we should continue to ride because we didn't want the rides to be stopped due to a violent act. However, uh, when we got to the bus station the next day, we couldn't get any bus drivers to take us out of, out of, out of Birmingham. And after uh, several attempts, we decided we could caucus, we got together and we decided we were gonna uh, fly. So we get to the airport, we buy our tickets, we get on the plane and there's a bomb threat. Wow, so you get back, you deplane, plane, you get back into the terminal, they get another plane, we get back on another bomb threat. Now it's beginning to get very, very touchy. Are we ever gonna get out of Birmingham? So we were fortunate because the Kennedy administration had sent a Mississippi follower down uh, to, to oversee uh, the, the government's action there. And he was able to expedite our flight out of Birmingham. And that's how we were able to get to New Orleans. Now it was really comical because the group at the bus station followed us to the airport and they were taunting us and their crowd was getting larger and larger. 
And that's why it was getting to be very um, scary on the ground. But when we got to New Orleans, instead of uh, Klansmen and spectators uh, taunting us, it was the police officers who were from the car and, and you know, they were cat calls and things because in those days, you didn't have that ways. You had to actually walk out on the tarmac to get on the plane. And they like, had a card on there and we had to go by these people. And you know they were they were not very nice at all. I mean, some of the things they said, you would say, you know, you really wouldn't want your kids to hear. But we did have some friends in New Orleans. So when we, once we got past the offices, we got into the terminal. There was a, a group of core people from New Orleans. They were a very good group of people that still are to this day. And they made us feel comfortable and they took care of us for the rest of the way. So when you got to New Orleans, uh, what, what thoughts were going through your head? What emotions uh, were you feeling? And um, how did you think in that moment, uh, your, what did you think your contribution to history was? What did you, you know, think about what impact you thought you might've had? Yeah, well, we were, we were disappointed first because we couldn't continue to rise. As far as our, our, our history and all that, that was the farthest thing from our mind. We knew we didn't have, we had no idea the impact of our actions. We just hoped that it would make a difference. And ultimately it did because a group of 13 started off and we, when we ended, there were over 436. But at the time, the biggest, uh, our concern was the fact that the rise were over, we weren't able to continue. But also before we left New Orleans, we found out the young people at, at Tennessee, in Tennessee, in Nashville, were prepared and willing uh, to continue to rise, and that made us very, very happy. And we had no idea that from that group, all the others that would come later on. Great. So I want to think about uh, kind of shifting to kind of discussions of today. Um, so first, at the beginning of the book, um, you talk about uh, your civics education, and in some ways about how it, it shaped you for future activism. Um, people talk about a dearth of civics education in America today. If you were in charge of crafting civics education for responsible citizens and for people who, you know, uh, would uh, become activists should the need arise, what would your version of civics education look like? Well, first, I'd tell the truth. And I, I would, you know, our American history and civics is, is taught in modules, bits and pieces. For example, the average American student doesn't realize how we became a nation from sea to shining sea. They don't realize the Indian Removal Act, slavery, the Louisiana Purchase, and the Mexican Wars all tie in together. Uh, you know, when they removed the Indians, why did they remove the Indians? Because they, the Europeans needed more land to grow more cotton, so they had more slaves, you know, uh, and out west, you know, kids wonder why there's so many cities out west that have Spanish or Indian names. Well, they used to occupy that land. So, so they don't real. We have not taught these these modules as a as a as a unit so that people can understand why these things happen and how they are interconnected. And I think once we are aware of how they interconnect and how American history has really evolved, then you have a basis to get started. Because right now. We still think that uh, for some reason, uh, you have to realize in the Civil War, those guys were traitors. Most of them, uh, they, well, they eventually their, their citizenship was restored and the soldiers had their pensions restored, but it didn't happen overnight. So because, you know, um, it was a lot of things that we celebrate that we, we shouldn't celebrate. And thank God we don't have, uh, you know, monuments to the Nazis that, people we fought are some of the other enemies of America. And I just think that once kids in, uh, know the true history of this country and you'd have a basis to move forward, um, it's painful. I mean, but the history, that's, that's history. But they, hey, if you deal with the truth, I think we are all so much better for it. And the thing is, you know, uh, then the kids get explained because right now there's so much that, that is missing from our history and we don't know. And you know, I've been trying to set a genealogy, and I get tired up in the in the, in the slave portion of my ancestry, and I get lost. I know Papa's dad and his granddad; they all spent 
bulk, the bulk of their life in slavery. And, you know, at the time, I didn't know that. And had I known that, I would have talked more to them to try to get more information because that was firsthand information about our ancestors in slavery. And that was an opportunity that I missed. Um, and I, you know, it's, it's, it's just amazing because I was, I think I was a very fortunate kid because I knew both sides of my maternal and paternal grandfathers on both sides. And I also knew an inkling of my great, great grandfathers. And that's something I think our young kids today have no idea, especially black kids. You, you, know, you mentioned in the book actually being pretty innocent as, as, as a youngster um, and sort of your awakening to sort of coming, you know, to being cognizant about racial difference and, and, and sort of what segregation and what Jim Crow looked like and what class difference looks like um, as well. Um, and I sort of got the impression, um, and forgive me if I'm wrong, um, that your parents tried to shield you from a, a lot of things. Um, and I think people struggle with that today. Um, parents struggle with how much uh, to teach uh, their children, particularly black parents teaching black children um, about the hard truths of racial history because they don't want them to feel stigmatized at all by having to hear that history. So based on your own childhood experience um, and you know, your experiences as an activist um, and a parent, what would you advise um, people to do in terms of teaching uh, young people and even very young people about the hard truths about American history and about their heritage? First, it, it starts with the family and the community. Uh, I, I think that um, sometimes we live in a community, but we don't consider ourselves a part of that community. And I think that uh, one of the things that we found out uh, since we were basically forced to do that uh, in the so-called black community, we had everything. We had all the amenities that you had in the larger society on a smaller scale. And we really didn't have to interact with a lot of whites until the major holidays where you had to use it to measure department stores and things like that. So we, that sheltered us. But now our kids from, from, the, from birth, they can be exposed to in and everything. But I think parents need to explain to the kids when they have questions, you know, about certain things, they should just take the time and explain to them. Well, like so for example, like uh, when we all watch uh, the policeman with his knee on the Lord's neck, you know, that was a, that was a teaching moment. Uh, you know, we all black parents have to tell their kids when they, when they go out at night or when they go to stores and how, how their conduct and how if they don't, they don't understand that they're being watched from the time they enter the store until the time they leave. Other races don't, I mean, don't have to do that. But uh, it's, it's such a, we have, for our kids, it's a constant teaching thing on your conduct and your behavior. You know, uh, we, you can't be a normal kid in a normal society because they don't look at you as normal. So, and, and, and until, uh, until that changes, we as parents, we as adults, we are members of the community, we have to constantly educate not only our kids, but other people's kids. I mean, sometimes, you, you know, that's what used to happen to us. If we did something wrong, the neighbor would pull us aside, or one of the old men would pull us aside and give us a tongue lashing, as he used to say. But they would tell us, you know, what we needed to do, how to be successful. You know, like they used to say, uh, you know, if you're not going to stay in school, join the army, they'll make a man out of you. That was a very common phrase in the Black community because they, they knew if you didn't, Get an education, you're not going to have a job, you're not a help, or you're not going to be a useful person. So there was a lot of a lot of wisdom in the community in those days, and it was shared. So it was not only just your parents, but the other people in the community as well. Well, so you mentioned George Floyd, and um, I mean, we would be remiss if we didn't actually tie the work that you did 60 years ago to the moment that we've been in for the last seven um, or so years. So we're in another major civil rights moment. What are the linkages um, in your view uh, between the work uh, that you did in the Atlanta Student Movement um, and in the Freedom Rides and the movement uh, for Black Lives today? <laughs> Well, the biggest difference is that in our day, uh, the first responders and police were not on our side. Remember, uh, the dogs was, that were sick on us was by the police and the ones who hosed us down were the firemen. So, but nowadays, 
that's one of the things the, the kids have uh, demonstrated that they have in their favor. The, in most cases, uh, law enforcement is on their side and also the first responders. But I, I think one of the lessons uh, we learned um, is that when we had demonstrations, um, we had more control of our demonstrations. Uh, we had monitors throughout. We didn't do anything at night. Um, uh, we had a dress code. Um, also, uh, as we got uh, further into the movement, uh, leaders like Dr. King and uh, uh, Reverend Sells were, they had the phone numbers of people who could make decisions. Nowadays, the demonstrators in the street and uh, the mayors and governors, there's no communication because, you know, when something happens, no one can talk to anyone. You know, uh, it, a lot of things could be cut off early on if, if, if say, the mayor see that there's a, a, a ruckus at, say, uh, Centennial Park, he can call the demonstrators and say, what are you guys doing? Or you need to stop this. But there's no talking until afterwards. Uh, there's no pre-planning. Uh, there's no desire to resolve the issue because really you don't have to demonstrate if you could talk to the people who make decisions. Uh, uh, you know, it's, um, I'm hoping that kids will learn how to take their demonstrations from the street. Once you have your demonstration, you go and you have your speeches, you have prayers, you have songs, then somehow, how do you move that discussion from the streets into the boardrooms and executive suites of the mayors and the governors, because they are the people who ultimately can make decisions. But the thing is just marching for the sake of marching, it gets your spirits up and you get a lot of people involved. But the thing is you want, you want to be successful. You want to have accomplishments, but you also need to know what your goals are. You have uh, things that you, you are upset about. You, ex you explain what your grievances are, but then you have to know what the solutions are. And how do you arrive at solutions? People who can make decisions, you articulate, you negotiate, and hopefully uh, you will have a settlement. But I, I, it as a process, I think, um, that's a process. And Atlanta was as a, as a good example because before we actually engaged in any type of demonstration, we were at re there was a manifesto that was written that outlined our grievances. And so the neighborhood community knew what we wanted. Today, it seems like Nobody ever knows what the, why the people are demonstrating. You know, like there's a big thing about defunding the police, but it has never been articulated by the people who are demonstrating. You have to define who you are. You have to define what your mission is. And you must let the people know so they can support you. I mean, you know, we see people marching. You say, why are they marching? Somebody should have told them, you know, this is what we're going to do. And this is how we're going to do it. Very simple. I mean, very easy to understand that nobody can come out there and say, well, what are they doing? You know, right now, everybody seems to be so confused when they see thousands of people up and down the street and they don't know why they are there. You know, um, but we just, we are a society that can make decisions. We are a society that can solve problems. Well, there's a tornado like today was kind of shaky. I mean, what happens to, what do Americans do? We roll up our sleeves, we get out there, and we fix it. Hurricane, same thing. Or any type of natural disaster, we work together and we get things done. But on a day-to-day -day basis, we can't get anything done. We're constantly at each other, getting each other's throat. And it doesn't have to be that way. It really doesn't. So uh, there are a couple of things. I mean, so one, there are uh, certain places where I think you can go where I think the aims of Black Lives Matter are clearly laid out. And while I think there's contestation over certain details, like what does defund the police mean? I mean, I think there are people who have written and articulated this um, in a particularly clear way. Um, one of the things, and, and there are people who are particularly in Atlanta, I mean, especially like last year after the George Floyd protest, where there were definitely people who were in communication with the mayor's office and with the, and with the police in particular to distinguish themselves from <laughs> who, were, who were vandalizing property, um, you know, about this time uh, uh, last year, you know, within a couple of weeks of that first anniversary. Um, but you know, one of the sort of lessons that uh, Black Lives Matter took from the civil rights movement is this notion of having a leader full movement um, because of a concern that if uh, people are organized around a couple of pivotal players, that if those uh, if those leaders are removed or silenced in some way, shape or form, that the movement could fall apart and they want to avoid the cult of personality. So what do you think about 
you know, just the idea of having a much more diffuse, more decentralized leadership structure as a means of, of survival um, and, 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 and perhaps minimizing sort of like the role of, of, of martyrdom. I've had discussions with Birmingham um, Black Lives Matter group, Atlanta's uh, Black Life, and several others, Portland as well. Um, and I understand uh, their feelings. Um, I know they have threats and they've been uh, threatened with, you know, with, with injury, bodily injury and all those kinds of things. But that's, that's comes with leadership. Um, because, but what they don't realize, uh, you have a movement that has a name, but it doesn't have a face. In other words, when you talk about SCLC or you talk about anything that in the, uh, our movement, you, you had faces like uh, Dr. King, you had James Farmer, you had Dr. Lawson, you had uh, Jose Williams, it's on and on and on. These personalities, and true, of course, many, some or all of them were killed, and some, a lot of them were attacked. I mean, a lot of them got beatings. And so John Lewis, God knows, he took more beatings than anybody. I mean, John was, I mean, if, yeah, wow. I mean, he was a dear friend, but he, I mean, he suffered more than any uh, modern day civil rights leader that I know of. But the thing is, by decentralizing the leadership, you don't have, uh, the body can't, you can't lead, you know, you can't have a, a three-pronged monster out there. You've got, someone's got to take the leadership. You lead from the front and you, and, and yeah, you're you going to be threatened. That's, that comes with the territory. But I know it's dangerous because today you have something that we didn't have to worry about. You didn't have the ability of the people to carry arms openly like we've had. And a lot of these people have challenged demonstrators. And I know there's a fear factor. And also people have been lost their lives. But I, I just think that they need to, someone needs to stand up and says, uh, you know, when uh, you say that I'm uh, president of the Atlanta chapter of Black Lives Matter, it should have a face. And like I say, you need to be able to call somebody. If you, if you know, if I have your number and you're not the leader of the day, it does me no good to talk to you. I need to talk to someone who can make a decision. Likewise, on the other end of the spectrum, you know, have you ever played phone tag when you call a government agency? You go round and round and round trying to get to somebody that can make a decision. But you, in, in, when, in today's life, you can't operate like that. We've got to have somebody on speed dial or on your Rolodex so you can get to them in times of trouble or in times to prevent things from happening or, or after things have happened. Um, and I think that this, well, basically what we're saying is there has to be communication. But you got to know who you got to communicate with. I also want to come back to a point that you made about uh, policing. And so you noted that you know we don't have Bull Connors um, of, of of the world. So you don't have police chiefs or police commissioners who are necessarily like standing there and ordering people to be hosed. Um, and and there might be a, a level of protection. But I think some people would also think about the you know uh, police who. Uh, uh, you know, pepper sprayed people, uh, you know, uh, around uh, the White House last year. Um, and, you know, they will, of course, think about people like Derek Chauvin, individual officers who are engaging in acts of violence against Black people on a daily basis um, and that are precipitating these, la these large scale uh, movements for change. So uh, what is the role, um, you know, of the state and what is should be the relationship of activists to the state in some way, shape or form in order to, you know, call for change and to take ownership of some of the structural problems in order to address them? Most uh, cities in most states have a forum where you can uh, go before the, your lawmakers and a lot of them have uh, uh, meetings, especially the uh, congressional uh, delegation and come and have uh, meetings and it's an opportunity uh, to express your grievances and to make them aware of things that are happening in your, in, in your community. Um, I think that it should happen more regularly. I think it always happens in, a, in, a, in a, an election year. All the politicians are out there, you know, explaining uh, their positions and so forth. But the thing is, there are things that happen on a day-to-day -day basis that we as citizens, as regular citizens, need to get before our congressional leaders. Uh, I, I would hope, uh, I write my, my uh, congressional leaders. I have always have, uh, and some I've been pleased with and some I have not been pleased with. 
And uh, but I think that uh, most citizens should get involved uh, by by in some form of communication, either by emails, because most of them allow you to email them, or you go to their offices and things like that. But I think that if you're going to uh, effect change and make your community better, you've got to have communications with those people who enact laws and also who control the uh, first responders and, and law enforcement people uh, in your community. There needs to be a dialogue somewhere along the way. Because I think we all, no matter where we live, whether we live in Buckhead or on Bankhead, uh, you know, you want the same kind of protection uh, that you you get in each one of those communities, and sometimes there's a big difference between policing in Bulkhead and policing on Bankhead. So I want to get back to uh, the discussion of the generational divide. So uh, you were part of uh, a generational divide uh, in your day, um, and you mentioned this idea of compromise and being able to negotiate. Um, and uh, today you might be on the other side of the generational divide uh, with, 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 with Black Lives Matter. So what is it like on both sides of that generational divide and how would you bridge that divide between the leaders of Black Lives Matter who are millennial, um, you know, Gen Z, some Gen X, um, and uh, your cohort of activists who represent the baby boom generation or the silent generation? That's a very good question. I, I, I'm so honored by the young people today, their enthusiasm. Uh, and I know that change begins with young people, always throughout the world, wherever there's effective change, young people are involved. Uh, the only uh, thing I differ is that um, look, you know, take from the good things from other movements, whether it's the labor movement, the uh, women's movement. Uh, on and on and on, there are a lot of uh, things that you can do. It's not my position, my position to tell you how to demonstrate because you may come up with a very unique way that's very effective. So, I mean, that's not my job. My job is to support you when you're right and to you know to be there to provide financial aid or whatever aid it needs, takes for you to be successful. Because if you're successful, our community is successful. Therefore, as Americans are successful. So it's, it's, it all, it's all tied together. So I'm not so critical of the young people and what they're trying to do. Even their tactics, like I say, it's not for me to determine that. I just have, would like for them to remember this. If you are, are leading a demonstration, you are responsible for every person in that march or whatever it is that you're doing. It's your responsibility. And see, that's where the leadership comes in. If you diffuse your leadership, then nobody has ownership of responsibility. And that's what has happened during the last uh, summer, uh, we lost control. People who had a, other agendas started bombing cars and, and uh, the fire bombing buildings and things like that. And we knew that it weren't the Black Lives Matter people, but they had no way of proving that those were not their people. And that's one of the things that hurt them is they lost control. And uh, because there are people who are out there who don't share the same agenda that you do, and would do things to, to belittle you or make you look bad. It happened to Dr. King. Dr. King's last march in Memphis, uh, had, there was violence for people who had been paid to disrupt his demonstration. So that's why we always had monitors all throughout our march. If it's a two block march or a 10 block march, we had three off the march. We had people to monitor, to make sure our people didn't do anything that was, was violent because we were a nonviolent demonstration. And I've told the groups that I've worked with ways that they can um, prove to the law enforcement that those people who do things like that are not theirs. And I said, you need to be able to do that. And in an aftermath, you know, when you get together and discuss what went right and what went wrong, then if the police can say, well, these people, and you, there means you can do it. And I don't mean with cell phones. There's another special way I told them that they should do use these tactics to prove to law enforcement or news media, whoever, that those were not our people. And once they regain control of their demonstrations, a lot of the stuff that happened last summer should not and would not have happened. So, you know, uh, to, to kind of uh, sum some of, uh, of this up in terms of, I think the tactical advice that you're giving, um, which, uh, you know, is, is certainly neat. And I'm glad to hear that there is, is conversation between the generations. 
is it, you know, is some type of generational clash in some ways inevitable? Are young people always kind of destined to kind of be very energetic and impatient and are older people always more cautious? And should we just accept that, that that's part of the cycle of life? It is a cycle of life because one of the things we would have never have done is that we would never have allowed you to wear a backpack in our demonstration unless it was clear. Uh, you know, we, in many cases, we wouldn't even carry a, a pencils or anything that would be used as a weapon. Our picket signs had no sticks. We did everything to minimize anything that could be used as a weapon, even a fountain pen, a ball, a well, fountain pen. I don't know if most people don't know what a fountain pen is today, but fountain pens, for example, was, was basically, we, we wouldn't carry those because they could be used as a weapon. So um, that was one of the big, I think, generational differences there because young people, they, you know, the backpack is just as normal to them as, you know, as a slide rule is to an engineering student, you know? So, uh, uh, yeah, it's 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 comical because um, I think in in Atlanta, for example, when you had the things this past summer, some kids had a one kid uh, at CNN had a, a blowtorch in his backpack, and a bunch of the young ladies had a spray paint in their their backpack. See, and you know, like I say, if you're responsible for the people in the, in in your in your movement, then you can't allow the, that kind of activities or those kind of things that could be used to. Um, damage other people's property. Hmm. So, well, thank you for that. So I assume that when um, uh, John Lewis was marching on Selma, so I know he had a backpack that particular day because he had a piece of fruit and a book with him um, yeah. because he figured he was going to get arrested, but that everybody knew what was in his, his backpack. Yeah. yeah, well, thank you so much. Um, I see Tony is back, so I know that he is going to help curate uh, our audience Q&A, but it has been a pleasure to speak with you. Well, thank you. Uh, you're you're not going to go too far away, Andre. There are there are a couple of questions, and 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 if you have questions, you can put it in the Q and A box. Um, but one before I, I get to those, one thing I'm curious about, Charles, um, your parents. Uh, how did you tell them, and at what point did they know that you weren't just going to Washington and riding the bus back? Well. You know, it, it took a while to convince them to even allow me to go. And that's mainly because I didn't quite tell them the whole truth. I just told them I was going for advanced training. I didn't tell them about the ride back. However, on uh, May 13th, the night before we went into Alabama, uh, I was I stayed in my own bed because, you know, we, we stopped off in Atlanta. And I got a chance to talk to mom and dad, and I convinced them to let me continue to ride. And I basically explained about what happened with the shoe in in Charlotte. And I told him about the scuffle that John Lewis and had had in uh, Rock Hill. And um, and I said, well, yeah, but I said, you know, we're trained in nonviolence and, uh, you know, we'll be all right. And uh, they, mom finally came around and she granted, well, basically her, 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 her blessings. And I'm glad I did because, you know, uh, had I not told her in that next day and not having instant communication like they have today. All they saw on the news today evening was a bus was burned and other people were beaten, but they had no idea of how bad we were. So um, and that's one of the reasons I'm glad I finally level with them and, and, and you know, not convinced them, but they, you know, persuaded them to let, allow me to continue on the rides. Mm -hmm. And the Thing is, what what kind you're you're a college freshman at that point? Are are you a kind of a uh, you think nothing's going to happen to you? Um, you're you're a young person with that, and and you think you know I'm 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 invincible. I can I can do this. I wouldn't put it quite like that, but I I did sense that um, that day for whatever reason. I felt no pain and I was not afraid. Now I know I should have been afraid, but I had played football, I had boxed and wrestled. So I knew what pain was. But when they were beating us, you know, I took their best punches. I didn't get they never were able to knock me off my feet. And uh and I didn't cry out and I didn't feel any pain. And I don't for I to this day I have no idea how that came about. I mean, uh why I felt no pain. Um so it allowed me to do things that I probably would never, I, you know, I didn't run, 
Like when they let me go in Birmingham, when the picture was taken of me being beaten, I just walked away. I just walked out to the, the street and if fate would have it, a, a bus came by and I got on it. And the driver, he saw me and he saw I needed aid and he told me what, he took me several blocks and he told me what I needed to do. But uh, no, I, I, you know, I, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't have so brave or anything like that. It was the fact that I had knew I had a job to do, but I think the events of the day made it possible for me, for me to maintain my composure. I think the next day, if you look at the pictures that were taken the next day, there was a lot of bewilderment in my eyes, but the, the day of the event, no, it, it didn't exist. Is, is it important that the violence that was uh, inflicted on you and, and the others, the burning of the bus, that it was publicized. And I think of that also in terms of George Floyd, that had there not been someone there with a camera to show what's happening, that um, nothing would be accomplished. Well, it was an eye opener. And I think I thank God that uh, those images existed. And I think that, uh, I think there are others out there. Uh, last year, uh, during the pandemic, there were images of me and others that I had never seen before. And I understand that there's a surprise for me uh, on that 60th anniversary, there's a, a, a photo of me shortly after I was rescued and taken back to the church in Birmingham of me and Reverend Shellsworth together. And I, I don't, I've never seen that photo before. And I understand there's a three or four images like that that exist that I've never seen. Mm -hmm. You had talked about, depending on the kindness and generosity of, of others, um, but uh, one of our viewers was asking, how do you fund trips like this of the Freedom Riders and this kind of program? Well, in, in our day, what they, well, I guess in the black church, we call them love offerings. Uh, what would happen, we would get there to a mass meeting and we would tell well, one of these riders would be the speaker for the evening. And then they would line us up and let the people come by and shake our hands and at the end of the line would be a, 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 um, a tray, uh, collection plate, and they would allow people to help uh, uh, provide uh, the funds needed to for the trip. But that's how we, that's how we function. I know initially CORE handled the, trans the tickets, uh, you know, uh, and that was quite an, an ordeal. Even under those circumstances, um, under today's circumstances, it wouldn't be very expensive, but for the, for the time period of time, it was quite ex expensive because it was about on like any given day. If we had any core people, you're talking 15 to 17 people a day that get a that had to be lodged and fed. And like you say that you know if you were fed during your ride when you made your test, you had to have money to pay for your food there. So, yeah, I I think. Uh... Uh, there's an exhibit that the Carter Library, I think, is going to have later this year about the Green Book that gave people ideas of who they could count on to uh, to shelter them, to, to help feed them, uh, because that's the way it was then. And in fact, you, you saw discrimination firsthand just trying to go to college. I understand you were accepted to MIT uh, but the tuition is very high, and you tried to go to Georgia Tech uh, and were not allowed. Is that right? That's correct. It's, uh, it's amazing. Not only uh, MIT was expensive, but you have to realize that there were no scholarships uh, available. I think the Fulbright scholarship was one of the few scholarships that had the kind of funds it took to get into a school with tuition that high. Uh, because like George Tech was only three hundred seventy-five dollars a semester, but but Morehouse was three hundred fifty, so it's only a twenty-five dollar difference between Morehouse and Georgia Tech. We were on a semester uh, schedule in those days. Mm -hmm. 
I, I see your book uh, there on the bookshelf behind you, Buses Are Coming. And one of our uh, our viewers was asking what you think of some of the other books that have been written, uh, the Freedom Riders, Freedom's Main Line, uh, The Children, uh, uh, Taylor Branch's Third. Um, what, what do you think of those? They're all a part of a puzzle. And I'm encouraging my colleagues who are yet alive to write this story because as we get all the different viewpoints, I think we get a more complete picture of what it was like because what I saw as an 18 year old and my feelings as an 18 year old, I'm obviously is different from someone who is a 22 and from another part of the country. You know, I'm a, I'm a child of the South. A lot of the kids were from the North and Midwest and also California, well, the, the far West. So their experiences and what they brought to the table was considerably different from mine. So that's why I've been encouraging them all to, to even if it's just a short story, you know, get it out there so people can see. And when we put all these pieces together, I think you get a more com complete picture of what it was like and our impressions as young people. Because, you know, I knew I, as being a child of the South, I knew what uh, Jim Crow was, I knew what segregation was. But a lot of kids who participated, who helped us, had no idea of what it was like until they came down south. You know, and if they if they were white, it really didn't affect them. They had the privileges that they didn't realize once they came south. And and that goes to Andre's question from earlier about what do you what do you teach kids? Um, how do you how do you let people know um, what it was like? Um, and and what it took to try and make the progress that that has been made. I, I think one of the things, one of the projects that probably was one of the most uh, successful, and I've used a modification of it, is Mrs. Elliott's uh, um, um, blue eye, brown eye, de a demonstration, and show how uh, let kids put them in groups uh, based on some commonality. And, and then you show prejudice towards the other. And then you, at a later time after they experience it, then you switch around where the ones who are being discriminated against becomes a dominant group again. And I think when kids can act out roles like that, they realize how it feels to, to, to be discriminated. For example, what a lot of people didn't understand about the South, say if you were shopping in a store and uh, say they, the, the restroom for colors people was on the first floor and you're on the second floor, well, you've got to make it down to the first floor to use the bathroom, even though you may be standing in front of a, a restroom on the second floor. Same thing about a water fountain. You had to know in that particular establishment where the facilities were. And in most cases, you know, they were not co-located. Another thing, a lot of stores in the early days, they had white men, white women, and then they had another one said colored. They did we it was a gender, I mean it's, we just had one restroom for men and women. You know, it's, you know, it's, but you had to know the layout of the land up in the store that you're in. And then of course there was some that didn't didn't allow you to use the facilities at all, which meant that you had to leave that store and go to a store that would allow you to use the facilities. Which is why I think it's important to have first person. Uh, books like yours to to let people understand what it helped people understand what it was like and that you're not just a person that people read about in history and you are you're a living breathing person uh, who's had to go through this and and this is this is your story and that's why I think books like this are 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 really so important. And one one of our viewers was asking if there are places that they can go to find lists of people who were active in the civil rights movement. They're trying to do some genealogy and trying to understand, you know, if maybe their relatives uh, played a role in this. I think for the Freedom Ride, uh, uh... Ray Arsenault's book is probably the most detailed. It's, I mean, it's a scholarly work. And he chronicled uh, all the Freedom Riders on the day that they were participated, the day they were arrested or whatever happened to them. 
Um, and I, I and uh, there's a lot of other information they also follow up on. Then there's a second book uh, put out uh, called The Breach of Peace, which uh, um, parallels the mug shots and present day uh, uh, pictures or uh, images of, of people, which shows a contrast in how they were, you know, in 61 and how they look uh, today. And those are both good books. And I, I encourage them to get also to do this, you know, uh, do when I have uh, lectures to, you know, check your DNA. I said, you know, you never know. They might be in my family tree. And, I, you know, I've been, my wife is heavily into genealogy and she's gone back quite a ways. I haven't gotten further than 1845 because when you start dealing with slave, uh, uh, slaves and enslaved people, uh, the records um, are very terrible because in most cases they didn't care and, you know, they don't use names. They're, you're, it's just ages and you just have to know the surname of the person that owns your family and on and on and on. But even that, it's a good adventure because I learned so much and I wish I had questions I have today. I wish I had an opportunity to ask my great, great grandparents when they were alive. Mm -hmm. Andra, um, one quick question. Since the James Weldon Johnston Institute um, looks at race, uh, where we've been and, and how far we have to go. How important is it for people like uh, Charles Person to, to tell their story? Well, it's really important. Um, I mean, first person accounts, oral histories are important because this is how we know what happened. And this is how we are able to put things into context. And so one of the things that, that you do, Mr. Person, in, in the book is you provide history. You also name some of the more unsung heroes and heroines. I mean, you make a point of putting it into a historical context of, now, of acknowledging that you uh, weren't the first freedom rider, um, that there were people who uh, you know, had been trying to desegregate uh, public transportation for years before um, you, even before Rosa Parks. And so you provide this long history of that, which is which is really helpful. Um, also, uh, academics wouldn't have anything to write about if there weren't people like Charles Person um, to interview, if we didn't have their papers to examine. And I think probably in response to the question about where to go to find names, um, we only know what's been submitted to archives, right? And when people go through archives and they process them, right, they will try to, you know, especially if somebody has written a name, it's the type of thing that could show up in a finding aid. And if you go through a library search, that's where it, you could find it. You might actually find the original document. You could go back and look at the primary source um, for yourself. But oftentimes, even particularly for this generation, um, stuff is in people's basements. Um, stuff is in folks' attics. It's not always temperature controlled. It could be subject to mold and rot. And so um, if you have that type of data, there are libraries all over the country, including Emory's Own Rose Library or the Auburn Avenue Research Library um, or the Woodruff Library at Clark Atlanta University who are equipped to take care of it, to preserve it, to digitize it, um, and to make sure that's widely available for your research and for other people's research. So I would just encourage people who you know might be sitting on old boxes, please give them to the archivists um, so that we can um, disseminate that information so that people can find their relatives and so um, that people can put these comprehensive stories and histories together. Well, this has been a, a fascinating evening tonight of the story. As I said, uh, Charles Person has a new book out. It's called Buses Are Coming, Acapella Books. Not only has copies of the book that you can purchase online, uh, but they uh, also have an autographed book plate, which I think because of what he did and what he stood for makes that uh, that book, just invaluable, something that you want to have. So I want to thank both of you, Andre Gillespie and Charles Person. This has been a, a fabulous evening. Uh, just, uh, I just feel delighted to have been able to, to sit and listen to you all. So thank you both, and thank you for watching. Uh, join us again for more author programs from Acapella Books and the Carter Presidential Library. Have a good evening. Thanks for having me. Thank you.